Okay, uh, thank you Professor for the introduction and uh, thank you organizer for the invitation. Uh, so, and also, I mean the amazing hospitality. I feel like in plus 20 hours, I have gained two kilograms already. So, um, and also thank you Professor Pradeep uh, for the invitation. Uh, and it's, it's a pleasure to stand on the shoulder of giants, isn't it? Uh, so, and I think the first challenge is to keep you awake because after the heavy lunch, everyone's like, you know, when it will be ending, isn't it? So, um, let me just tell you a, a small story for the students particularly. So, um, Professor Pradeep and another professor, uh, great professor uh, Vishwanathan used to take our, uh, you know, physical chemistry lab. So, and I'll just quote it actually, it's, it used to be a terror. Okay, because the questions used to be very, very difficult. So everyone would like to go at the end so that the professor becomes tired. But oh dear, they never get tired. So the question used to be even difficult and difficult and more difficult. But thanks to those difficult questions, I think we are here today. And also I would like to thank Professor uh, Essien uh, who made my job easier because he gave the introduction to my talk already. And, uh, you know, because I was thinking that after lunch, everyone will be uh, kind of feeling sleepy. So we need an attractive slide. So what will be the attractive slide? And uh, that already got revealed. Uh, but the attractive, uh, that one came to my mind when I came here. And that is your favorite food, unnakai, right? So I think whenever you see this one, I feel like a different joy will be on your face. Right? And imagine you go to Bangalore and the first thing you see this one, it's like gobble up. Right? But there will be some old people like me who would be thinking, huh, how much oil is there? How much sugar is there? Right? So why this is important is that uh, whenever we eat up these things, we have some you know, fighters in our body or uh, some soldiers who would you know, chew them up, chew, uh, then make it small molecules, then the body can handle it very nicely. And those guys are called enzymes. And one of the major enzymes that is useful in this matter is lipase. So what it does is it hydrolyzes uh, triglycerides. So these oily foods have a lot of triglycerides. So it has to be broken down into small pieces, right? So this enzyme actually uh, does this job very nicely. You know, it cleaves it in a, into small molecules. And what is enzyme for them, uh, for those who do not know, it's basically you no know, small amino acids are there, whereas amine group and acid, uh, carboxylic acid groups are there and also various other, uh, you know, um, basically functionalities are there. There are 20 uh, natural amino acids and they make some peptide bonds. And then finally, they can make huge molecules like this, which are enzymes. So another enzyme that is useful for digesting unnakai is alpha-glucosidase. Okay, that also cleaves uh, this kind of sugar moieties, you know, and uh, will make it a small molecule like this. Not that every enzyme is good. Some enzymes are responsible also for our bad health. And one of the enzymes that made our life hell was during corona. What is that? So this is uh, called angiotensin converting enzyme 2. So because of this enzyme, you know this corona, bad corona can really attach to our host cells and can grow nicely. So that means, you know, stopping this enzyme is important. Right? So what I wanted to convey to you is that there are some enzymes which, you know, you want to uh, make better perform and there are some enzymes you want to actually switch off so that your body does not react to that, right? Oh, it's not working. Sorry. So one such enzyme that um, I thought of work on uh, is called uh, sphingomyelinase. So this is again, you know, uh, related to heart diseases actually. So you can see that I'm very much worried about that. 
So this enzyme sphingomyelinase uh, is found uh, on cell uh, membrane a lot. So it's a membrane enzyme. So what it does is it cleaves sphingomyelin lipid into two pieces. Okay. And if you have loads of these enzymes that can give you different diseases such as atherosclerosis is basically, you know, heart failure, heart attack. And uh, I know that in the UK, they uh, screen these enzymes for this disease called Nemanpic disease in children. I mean, newborn babies actually, they uh, check it. So, and you can see from this one that uh, chronic heart failure patients, this enzyme gets upregulated. Upregulation means uh, um, increase in the concentration. Okay, so detection of this enzyme is very important then, right? So if you can detect this enzyme and see how much is the concentration, then that will be useful for uh, the next uh, steps. Like let's say we have to, you know, boost it or switch it off, something like that, isn't it? Uh, and also like if you know that how much is the concentration, then you can tell, oh, well, uh, this person might be going to heart failure or some heart diseases, right? So we can stop it. Or maybe we can ask them not to eat unnakai. So for whenever it comes to the detection, um, so WHO has some guidelines for making diagnostics, but this is particularly for point of care diagnostic. So point of care diagnostics means the diagnostics that you can use uh, at, by yourself, right? So at home or even the primary care, like health center, you go and they can do it. And I think we know actually two diagnostics which are point of care. I think everyone knows one is the blood glucose meter, another one is a pregnancy test. So these are the um, two most famous point of care diagnostics, right? So WHO has this sort of regular uh, direct uh, directions like it's called assured. So these should be the conditions uh, for a successful point of care diagnostic. Okay, in that, if you see one thing we want to uh, achieve is rapid and robust, it must be fast and also equipment free, means I don't need anything for the detection, right? In that, calorimetric detection is one which really helps. So, we wanted to design some calorimetric test for this enzyme, and I'm not the first one to do it. In fact, in the market, there are some diagnostics but they are very, very expensive, okay? We in fact bought it and uh, tried to basically benchmark our assay. So it's quite expensive. And the time required is for this assay is uh, minimum uh, 3.5 hours. So or let's say altogether four hours you need for doing this. So our question was, can we get rid of these two problems, right? One is the uh, cost, another one is the time taken for the assay. So for that, we actually designed an assay based on gold nanoparticle. So gold nanoparticles are interesting uh, particles uh, as you have see, uh, seen from Professor Pradeep's uh, talk also. Uh, so these gold nanoparticles, you know, when they are all separate, they gives you red color or wine red color. But if you have something that couples them together, in other words, aggregates, so that will give you actually a blue color. So we, if you can, let's say, control this phenomenon, so you can actually have a color change from red to blue, isn't it? So, and this is the enzyme we are looking at, sphingomyelinase, and it cleaves into uh, two parts. So what we did actually, so um, we actually made some liposomes, and inside that we put this molecule called cysteine. Inside all the stars are those cysteines. And sphingomyelinase is known to cleave the membrane, okay? Once it cleaves, then we are expecting these stars to get released. And once it's released, you know, it binds to that and gives you a blue color. So basically using the color, you can do the detection, right? So it becomes that equipment free option. And this, so you know, if I say this, you should not believe me, you should look at the data to believe it. And this is actually the thing, you can see, you know, if you don't have the cysteine, it's all uh, separate and it's red color. If you have cysteine, it becomes blue, okay? And we also show using other techniques that they are indeed forming some bilayer membrane, all right? So then the moment of truth, whether it really detects or not, uh, and that is the assay. 
uh, you can see that the uh, basically as you increase the concentration of the enzyme your absorbance at this increases that means it becomes more blue all right and the limit of detection that we achieve is much better than the commercial assays and the time taken for the assay is much lower basically in half an hour we are able to finish it compared to four hours uh, not only that the selectivity is very nice within the concentration range that is uh, physiologically you know important and that's what we show here other proteins or other enzymes or other small molecules actually do not interfere in this assay so that means what we have been able to do is that we have been able to make a new kind of sensor for this important enzyme using a calorimetric detection so basically equipmentary and fast detection not only that the cost of this assay reduces a lot okay so now <coughs> so as um, Professor Essien talked about the sustainability. So we need something that can replace these uh, uh, highly costly molecule and you know that circular economy thing, right? So enzymes are actually very good, but they are really bad also in certain cases, such as harsh environment. So if you do it at different pH, high temperature, they are dead. So you can't use them really. Okay, not only that, to make them, you know, it's a really a time consuming process and uh, uh, storage is an issue. So if you see <coughs> that for this corona vaccine, for example, you, they will wait for like 10 people to come so that they immediately take out of the freezer and then gives you uh, because you cannot store it. So storing enzymes is actually a challenge. So, and also mass production. Right, so if we are not able to produce a lot, the cost become higher and uh, all the other problems actually are associated. So that means if we can actually get, uh, address these challenges, it will be really helpful, isn't it? So in that rescue something called nanozyme, which is the, in my title it was enzyme equivalent. So it's basically equivalent to enzymes which are nano in size. However, that definition now has been expanded a lot. So it does not require to be nano, but it's basically alternative to the natural enzymes. Okay, they can be actually uh, having those advantages to uh, you know get rid of these uh, challenges. All right, so what we have done actually uh, to mimic that natural enzyme called lacase. So lacase enzyme actually has copper centers. Okay, and those copper centers, uh, four copper centers, that leads to this reaction. So the lacase is a natural enzyme and is a very important enzyme that is used in industry also. Because uh, when uh, the decontamination of water, industry, uh, those, uh, you know, dirty water, uh, they use actually this enzyme. However, we know that the, you know, enzyme stability and all is very difficult. So what we tried to do is mimic this enzyme using copper oxide nanozyme and the synthesis is very straightforward. We you take copper nitrate and use some polyol and apply some microwave. You know, it gives you particle and that uh, you know, should give us the activity that we are looking for. And uh, we, you know, characterized using different techniques. They are actually spherical, uh, microporous, uh, micro, uh, I can't say nanoparticle because it's almost like 500 nanoparticle, nanometers. So these kind of microparticles, uh, you know, are formed in this process. And what we can show here is that the activity uh, of the natural enzyme is actually, uh, we can achieve. Not only that, the activity actually is much better than the, the, than the natural enzyme. So we have actually done those states, uh, those results actually. And what I was mentioning to you is that the stability or the performance at harsh conditions that the natural enzyme cannot deliver. So that actually you can see here at let's say this pH range, your copper, uh, this lacase is basically, you know, kind of dead after pH 6.5, but our nanozyme can give the activity. And particularly, you know, noticeable is high salt concentration. 
where you know this high salt concentration uh, will be there in the industry dirty water right so whatever is being uh, thrown into sea so they are actually you can still work quite efficiently not only that in many cycles it can work so in this case whatever the loss of activity you are seeing is because of you know the centrifugation when we are centrifuging we lose some of particle otherwise you know if you can actually preserve that one then you can see the number activity is 100 percent uh, over several cycles so that means we have been able to make some enzyme mimetic using some simple material which are very stable very active in harsh conditions all right and uh, this is actually to so the ability to sensing also I'll skip it okay now if you remember the title of my talk is also adaptable right so adaptability what do i mean by that adaptability is you know something that can uh, be very similar to uh, the natural systems and they will behave like a natural systems and one couple of properties i will mention in this case one is the biocompatibility and another thing is the reversibility so if you are able to make your nanozyme uh, biocompatible means the body will not you know hit it then it will be very nice right so in that uh, there is a term called supramolecular assembly so where you know small building blocks build up uh, larger molecules or the structures using non-covalent interactions means not use the covalent bond but the other non-covalent interactions you know can be utilized to make this right so in that um, so there are two kind of assembly one is called equilibrium assembly and out of equilibrium assembly i'll talk about the out of equilibrium one so what we have done again in this new system <coughs> So, um, we have made a nanozyme using a synthesized ligand, very simple ligand like this and we added metal ion here, metal ion and the simple ligand and a capping agent. You know that uh, by self-assembly self gives actually a bilayer uh, basical kind of structure again. And what we observed is that, <coughs> so it basically uh, gives you a um, this kind of spherical vesicular structure these are all the characterizations and the activity wise we can again see because of the copper center it again mimics the lactase enzyme activity uh, very nicely and again you can see that without the presence of this nanozyme you don't have any activity but you know it is there when you have the system right not only that, he, this is a comparison with uh, the natural enzymes and we can show that it's much better than the natural one. And also it shows other two activities, means uh, it mimics other two enzymes also called NADH peroxidase and horse resist peroxidase. Once again, the activities here are better than the natural enzymes. Now that adaptability or the reversibility is very important for natural systems. So we wanted to see if we can really make it uh, the reversible. And how we are doing? We are actually using pH as the fuel. So once you add the, <coughs> basically lower the pH down, you know, the system breaks down and then you don't see the activity. So that's what we are showing. As a function of the pH, you can make the assembly and break it, again make it, again break it, and the activity also uh, consequently goes down and up, down and up. So basically, you can regulate the enzyme activity, enzyme-like activity in this kind of stimuli-responsive manner, right? So we don't we did not show here i don't see uh, i did not show here but another things like anything that can bind to copper once again you know reduce the activity or break the system so you really have that adaptability built in okay once again I'll, uh, so needless to say uh, this is performing better than the natural enzymes okay and uh, so then you know we just wanted to see again the versatility of our system means does it show any other activity and in that we use this as a nanomedicine so nanomedicine means that something that cures some disease right 
so nitric oxide is known to be one of the uh, medicine that is used for uh, you know uh, curing some of the diseases so it can be like a medicine a drug so what we showed here is that our nano system can actually release nitric oxide very specifically and in a controlled manner so that's what we are showing here <coughs> okay so uh, like that you know concentration of this variation you can see it goes up not only that we can again show that reversibility or the adaptability very nicely where you know if you have this system slowly you will see that it's releasing the you know again you add the substrate again goes up again so basically that cycle you know goes on and on and then also we wanted to see if we can use this system for calorimetric sensor okay so for that what we have done is that so first thing is we have uh, detected another enzyme called acetylcholinesterase so this is actually in our central nervous system this enzyme is very very important okay and so if we do not have this enzyme then uh, many diseases like dementia alzheimer's and all this can happen and uh, you know so we wanted to see if we can detect this enzyme using our assay and what we have done here is that um, we have utilized this reaction so this is the enzyme as i was i am telling you acetylcholinesterase that cleaves this bond acetyl bond and you know releases this thiocholine so that thiocholine binds to this copper center and then this activity will be switched off okay so that's what we can see as you increase the concentration of the acid the enzyme you can see that the color becomes uh, none so basically you know the system is working so and we can show the sensitivity to be also very high compared to other methods so essentially using a calorimetric method we are able to detect this important enzyme now you know our farmers actually use a lot of pesticides okay and often these pesticides actually i mean particularly there are some organophosphorus pesticide those pesticides bind to this acetylcholinesterase enzyme okay so once it binds to the enzyme it actually inhibits that and uh, basically problems happen you will see that many farmers you know will have a shaky hand and also memory problem and all these things that's because you know uh, continuous exposure to these pesticides so if we can you know again detect pesticide so basically pesticide is bad for us so you will see that you know many, many uh, let's say food packaging and all you will see some amount of pesticides that's written okay that's very important so it has to be have a maximum level uh, above which it is not allowed so how can we detect those pesticides uh, very easily that's what we tried to show here you know basically as you increase the concentration of peep, this pesticide you can see the calorimetric uh, response is generated and the, again uh, the limit of detection that we report here using the calorimetric sensor is uh, the best so far okay so um basically again you know we have explored the system further using other kind of capping agent you know i showed you the capping agent with one in the other work but in this case we have used a trivalent capping agent so you know that shows like this now what it allows us is that it can allow us is a uh, basically covalent catalysis also something like um, retroaldol reaction and also another unique opportunity of these guys is that you have two types of medium so both organic reaction as well as aqueous reaction can be done using this system and that's what we show here this is the characterization and uh, yeah so you can see here <coughs> that this part actually so the nucleophilic substitution reaction that we are doing in um, organic medium okay so uh, that we can show that you know this in presence of the catalyst it is very active but if you don't have the catalyst it does not show any catalysis at all not only that the aqueous medium reaction this retroaldolase type of in, you know retroaldolase basically that kind of enzymes is present in our body so we can again mimic that kind of enzyme through this kind of system so essentially you know we have been able to uh, explore that as well now 
as I was telling you about the you know non equilibrium assemblies so so far you know most of the things that we have shown is equilibrium assembly like you know the most uh, energetically favored uh, so delta G is negative very much right but in our body there are many things which do not follow this equilibrium process so there are many non equilibrium processes okay for example uh, this formation and dissociation of actin filament so in this case you always have to spend some energy that is ATP gets cleaved to ADP and then you know energy is released so whenever we are, I am putting some energy in that means it's a non equilibrium process right so that is a classic example of non equilibrium process now to mimic that one there are many you know reports actually where you are using some fuel to give some assembly system and then that gives you some activity okay so what we have tried to do in this case we have also tried to make some non equilibrium assembly to enhance the activity of uh, certain enzymes let me explain what is going on here <clears throat> so this is um, basically a molecule that we synthesized and then in presence of ATP because you have three phosphate groups here and you have you know uh, one phosphate binds to one guanidium group of the, this molecule so it basically can give you multivalent binding so multiple uh, multiple uh, guanidium units can bind to one ATP so that actually gives you a non-equilibrium uh, system basically as long as you have the ATP you have the system okay now once the system is ready you add cytochrome C enzyme that binds to these moiety very specifically because cytochrome C actually has a binding site for this little group this adenine group so as a result it binds very nicely uh, with this and what we show is that the activity goes up quite a lot so that means we can regulate that activity right now before going to that let's see the <coughs> characterization and you can see that it's spherical molecules and uh, basically sac study shows that this is actually bilayer and we know what is the thickness of that also and then we showed you know how is it interacting using something uh, a technique called isothermal titration calorimetry that gives you information about delta h and delta s uh, and this binding constant also it you know gives us not only that we show using circular dichroism that the protein bound on the structure is not denatured so it's still as it is all right and then we show that you know the activity of uh, the enzyme goes up when you have the system compared to any other controls okay and not only that if you increase the chain length of this one your activity goes up quite a lot okay so this specific activity uh, as a function of number of particles is also uh, we can actually show here okay all right so now um, it, uh, we wanted to show whether it just does this a single enzyme catalysis or something very complicated also because in our body there are reactions which are called cascade reaction so basically what happens is that in our body also you take glucose you know this glucose oxidase enzyme breaks it down uh, to gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide now if you add cytochrome c it will give another reaction so this cascade reaction actually happen in our body so we wanted to see we wanted to see if that also possible on our system and you can see here very nicely that when you don't have our system the active this product formation is almost zero but when you have the system it goes up quite a lot right <coughs> so and we can show you like many other things basically the uh, other controls and the kinetics and everything all right so and then that basically the reversibility or the adaptability i'm just talking about you can see here very nicely so this enzyme called potato epirase can cleave those atp molecules now if you cleave the atp molecules it becomes something called amp means a monophosphate now when monophosphate is present it does not form the uh, assembly structure 
right? So that means you can use this enzyme to control this uh, formation and deformation of this system, right? So that's what we wanted to show here. You can see fluorescence is up means my system is formed. So as soon as you add ATP, the fluorescence goes up. And then because in this medium you have the apirase present, it goes down because apirase is cleaving that enzyme, sorry, cleaving ATP. So you don't have the system anymore. All right. So that's how you, you can continue the cycle many times. All right, and you can see that, you know, like other techniques also we are showing that it is indeed the case. And it is dependent on the, uh, this enzyme, okay. So, and, and not only that, the activity of the enzyme, basically the cytochrome C is bound on the surface, right? That activity also gets regulated as a function of this enzyme and the ATP. So you can do this process many times and you can regulate the enzyme activity many times, very similar to biological systems. Okay, so, and as I was telling you in the beginning that some enzymes we need to actually stop, right? So we need to inhibit so that we can have, uh, you know, a better uh, health. So one of the enzymes that helps uh, uh, inhibition of who's is very important is called chymotrypsin. Okay, so again, if you inhibit that one, then uh, it is related to many uh, enzymes, sorry, many diseases that you can stop. So what we wanted to do is that we wanted to make some sort of uh, <clears throat> non-covalent strategy such that it can actually inhibit that. And that we, we actually took help of this molecule uh, and this is actually forming something called coordination polymer. So basically this is intelligently designed. So this thiol group binds to silver because it's soft of interaction you know, and then this uh, alkyl chain uh, makes it stable, otherwise they will all agglomerate and does not give a defined polymer. And then you have these ethylene glycol chains that gives you the biocompatibility, so that does not, you know, break the uh, enzyme and also solubility becomes high in water. And this carboxylate group at the end, that binds to the enzyme because the enzyme surface charge is cationic. So this can bind to that and then inhibit the activity. Okay, that's what actually we wanted to show. And we show that, you know, for the CP is formed, we can show that it's one to one ratio of that silver and the ligand. And you can see how they are actually binding. And not only that, then we showed that the, it binds to the protein also without changing its structure. And then you can see this is actually beautiful that as you increase the concentration of the, uh, the coordination polymer, your activity of the enzyme drops down drastically, right? So you basically see that there is no actually activity to that. All right, and also uh, we can see that it is a non-competitive mechanism of action. All right, with that, I would uh, like to thank my students whose works have been presented here. The other students' work were not presented. And of course, without them, I couldn't do this work. And all the work has been done uh, in my lab after I joined in ISC. Uh, it's about four years in that one and a half year was gone by COVID. But uh, that's what we could achieve. And of course, thanks to ISC for the startup fund, ACRB for uh, as you, I've got some three grants from the CRB till now and also MHRD stars for uh, benevolent funding. And thank you for your attention. Hopefully I could make you awake. Uh, thanks for the excellent presentation. We, have, we will have some, a few questions, please. I'm not asking now. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I noticed that you were showing that there was an increase in the rate of the reaction uh, in your vesicular systems or in your liposomal systems. Mm -hmm. Do you think that is due to the fact that you're able to bring the reactants actually much closer than if it were a normal enzyme? Abso so, absolutely correct. Yes, it is a local concentration effect. So then the next question would be, would that be a fair comparison? with the enzymes because in the enzyme yes uh, to some extent yes because enzyme also work in crowded environment in which uh, you know basically that crowd again brings the local concentration to be high 
so in that way and also those enzymes often will be bound to membranes that way the, the concentration of enzyme is also again high so in you know cellular milieu also you have that local concentration that enhances the activity but yes if you say that uh, i would have probably done exactly the same way uh, that would be a difficult assay i believe I'm not going to ask uh, any of those <laughs> questions. The, uh, in the context of these uh, organophosphorus systems that you talked about, yeah. is it possible to extend the science to surfactants, uh, phosphate surfactants? Uh, and there are these wastewater problems that are plenty, and uh, not just detection problems, but remediation problems. Sure, that remediation can certainly be done use, uh, for other type of phosphate also, because it's the head group of the phosphate that binds to it. Mm. So as a result, you know, anything, the, uh, it doesn't matter what is the type of phosphate, it's mostly like any kind of phosphate with uh, basically more hydrophobicity would bind to it. So, and your, uh, the surfactant will have that property already. So, I'm sure it will work. And there are some other reports I was seeing some, uh, like that oxide materials I showed, they showed actually this phosphorus, means phosphorus uh, containing micelles and other things bind to that, and they can do remediation also. So, it's pretty much possible. Could you, I just wanted you to connect with the water center at IISC. Sure. See whether this is of relevance to them. Definitely, I'll do that. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Students should ask question. This uh, CO2O, uh, yeah. try, you were trying for uh, nanozyme, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, how stable is the cuprous oxide? Oh, it's very stable in this case because you uh, they, they are almost like embedded in uh, carbon matrix. Oh, I see. So what's the uh, carbon matrix? Here? Basically, the poly, poly we are using. Oh, oh. So and we are using microwave. We have oh. seen that in EDAX that mm. it is actually embedded in uh, carbon matrix. So there. it's simply carbon, or it's, so it's just. Uh, I think it's something like uh, what is this called? Um, Graphene type of I that see. kind of material it mm -hmm. forms. This polyol synthesis generally gives uh, capping ligands of from the. Right, but mm -hmm. in this case, it's not doing. Oh, that. I see. It is actually serving two purposes. Mm -hmm. One is the reductant, because I need to reduce the ah, copper yeah. too. That so it is the re reduction as well as uh, stabilization in that matrix, mm -hmm. as a matrix actually. And have you monitored the, how the metal oxidation center changes during the activity, or you? It's a defined mechanism uh, no so we actually did xps oh. xps and other uh, studies that shows that this copper center indeed you know cycling through the oxidation states such that you know it gives you the activity and the, and the catalytic cycle is complete okay we shall together thank someone has no irana someone has one more one more question yeah Hello, sir. Uh, can you please comment on the selectivity of uh, this adapted enzyme? Okay, yeah, so that's a great question. That is the future. Okay, so right now, if I say the selectivity, absolute selectivity is not there. Okay, uh, and that is the question. So we have another system that I did not show here. There I can see and what I have done in that case is that I've actually taken uh, amino acids, L and D amino acids to make the structures. And there I can show that beautifully it can have a selectivity between substrates, like very much similar to the natural enzymes. But yes, whatever I have presented here, selectivity in that sense is not there. We shall have further interactions if, if uh, needed during tea time, please. We shall together thank Dr. Subhinoy Rana for the excellent presentation. Now this is the end of this second session. We shall once again thank the three speakers for the presentations of their wonderful words. Professor Prakash uh, P. Nilakandan. Dr. Nina Susan John and Dr. Subhinoy Rana. Thank you. Uh, please, uh, please have